All right. Hey, excellent. Just a second, we'll be getting started here. Um, Just a second. Yeah, so, all right. Well, we're gonna get started with something in the different, something different in the garden, our third session. Uh, and we're gonna be seeing uh, Peggy Cornett and uh, Ira Wallace here in just a second. They'll be coming on, excellent. Here we see Peggy um, and Ira. Hey there, thanks for joining us. In just a second, we'll kind of introduce them a little bit more um, and we'll talk about our topic here. Uh, Something Different in the Garden is Gunston Hall's program where we discuss different 18th century influences in the garden, uh, African, European, and indigenous. And we talk about crops, techniques, ideas, and the people and communities that, that do work on those crops and, and how those crops and ideas and all of those things continue to shape our gardens today. Uh, today we have Peggy Cornett, the curator of plants at Monticello. Uh, and Ira Wallace, the owner and worker of a worker of Southern Seed Exchange, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, excuse me. Um, and both are expert gardeners and educators, especially when it comes to the many, many crops that we inherit from the past. Uh, just briefly to introduce all, our topic, I'm going to point out that today's theme doesn't fit quite as perfectly as some of our others do um, under those headings, uh, African, European, and Indigenous. It's really a combination of many of those elements. And this is because 18th century was a time in Virginia when many crops from around the world came together, especially in gardens and kitchens. Um, in Virginia, the kitchen was a space where enslaved cooks contributed immensely to what became American cuisine by combining African and European foodways with African, European, and indigenous crops. And so at sites like Gunston Hall, where the record is not as strong as we'd like it to be, um, we have such an opportunity to partner and learn from sites like Monticello, uh, where we know about some of the enslaved gardeners and chefs, like for instance, Wormley Hughes or James Hemmings. And by examining those stories, we can better understand what may have been happening at Gunston Hall, um, where perhaps Cato or Occoquan Nell may have been going about what they were doing in their gardens, um, how they were harvesting and cooking at a high level for the Mason family. Uh, their efforts made George Mason's contributions to our form of government possible and helped to ensure that many of the garden varieties we still treasure today were passed on. Uh, so from that context, we're gonna learn more about some of those 18th century gardeners, some of those important crops. We're gonna take a really deep dive into collards. I'm really excited about that um, and more. So I'm just gonna turn it over to Peggy, who's gonna start with a few slides uh, and then Ira's gonna hop in and, and do the same. So Peggy, it's all, uh, all you from here. Well, not really, but <laughs> jump on in. Thank you, Ryan. It's great. It's great to be with you again. Um, and I'm going to just show um, a little bit of my PowerPoint here and, and um, maybe repeat a little bit about what people know about Monticello. I'm basically focusing on the garden, the vegetable garden, um, at, and uh, the crops that were grown there. Uh, the, it's a, a very iconic um, garden. And um, some reason, oh, there we go. Um, it's a uh, thousand feet long and 80 feet wide. Uh, many people know this garden. Well, here it is at the height in the summertime when the, all of the crops are, are really um, coming into fruition. Um, we know that Jefferson documented over 330 different varieties of vegetables and herbs in his garden over the course of his lifetime. And, and um, they ranged from um, you know, all sorts of European um, uh, cool season crops to the warm season crops from South America, Africa, and, and um, Asia. Many people think of that garden as a, a beautiful um, expansive plateau, a terrace uh, that was carved out of the side of the mountain. Um, but we also have to remember that the, the garden itself was also a uh, enclosed garden. In Jefferson's day, there was a 10 foot high paling fence that's encircled this garden. It ran almost three quarters of a mile in length. It was uh, 10 feet tall. And Jefferson's directions were to set the pails so close together so that not even a young hare could get into the garden. Um, when we tell people about this fence, what you, you, what you do not see in the garden today, um, they say, oh, well, this is a wonderful deer fence. And um, 
<clears throat> in fact, uh, deer were not a problem for Jefferson. Um, in fact, he even had a deer park at Monticello where deer were um, kind of in, a, in an enclosed area and they were fed and, and almost like treated like pets. But um, at, at, um, at Monticello and Jefferson's day, uh, this fence was meant to keep, keep out not only small animals, but also people. And um, so the garden was not an, ex an easy access for the enslaved who lived uh, just a short way away on Mulberry Row and, and other points of the um, plantation. Monticello was a, a, a plantation farm uh, ex primarily. And um, so here in this, in this um, uh, watercolor illustration of Jefferson with his granddaughter uh, planting, and planting um, in the garden. We also see enslaved workers who were actually doing the labor of the garden. And so we know that the garden uh, was uh, an intersection of two worlds in many ways. And we know that while Jefferson was so uh, intent on cultivating uh, crops that were, um, uh, which we might consider um, the types of, of crops for um, uh, uh, elite gardeners, uh, such as artichokes, um, these were all being cultivated by the enslaved who lived here and worked here at Monticello. Um, we know that um, in, in, in this beautiful um, watercolor by Nathaniel Gibbs from uh, the year 2000 when it was painted, um, um, he's showing um, kind of a scene in the garden where uh, workers are, are hoeing the fields. Um, in, in 1809, Jefferson actually re recorded that the enslaved gardeners planted about 60 different fruits, vegetables, and herbs in less than two months in, in his vegetable garden. Um, in his farm book, uh, Jefferson kept um, uh, records of just about everything. And so we know we're very familiar with his garden book. Um, but in his farm book, um, he actually recorded uh, the names of the enslaved who lived and worked here. Over the course of his lifetime, Jefferson um, owned uh, upwards of 600 uh, individuals some were inherited and some were then born on during his lifetime. Um, in 1774, that was his first entry. And here we see uh, an 1810 entry. His last entry was for the farm book was um, 1824. And we have um, interesting records of uh, transactions with um, the enslaved that who we know had their own gardens at Monticello. Um, they were their, their gardens were located in, in other areas of the plantation, uh, not only on the Monticello Mountain, but also at Tufton Farm and, and some of the satellite farms surrounding Monticello. And Jefferson's granddaughter, his oldest granddaughter, Anne Carey Randolph, um, uh, was um, in, when she was 14 years old, she began negotiating purchases of vegetables um, from 40 uh, enslaved individuals. And this was begun while Jefferson was still president at the time. So it was in, um, he didn't retire until 1809. So for a three year period, she was handling these negotiations of purchasing uh, vegetables uh, to add to the, to the uh, household table. And this is just her notebook that she kept. It's, it's a fascinating document really. It, it includes, um, it's from, it was kept from 1805 to 1809. And it includes hundreds of transactions involving the purchase of produce from the enslaved. Um, she documents uh, the purchase of 22 species of fruits and vegetables and 43 from 43 different individuals. Um, uh, not only um, fruits and vegetables, but also um, uh, eggs and chickens um, uh, uh, were purchased uh, from that time. And many of these crops were purchased in, in the off season. Here we see some of the names she includes in this document, including uh, Bagwell, and she'll have Wormley Hughes is listed and, um, and many of the others who were um, 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 adding to the, to the uh, household table. Um, she um, was, even though there were um, 32 males and um, uh, with an average age of 37 um, in the, from the people she purchased from and 12 females, averaging 41 years of age, um, these transactions may involve purchases from uh, whole families. And so there was just an individual who was the, um, the representative of the household. So some of the crops, that, some of the primary crops that were being purchased included cucumbers, which is quite, quite interesting. 51 purchases of separate purchases of cucumbers. Um, Squire Granger sold cucumbers to Jefferson in 1773. 
um, uh, in in January. So it's interesting to note, you know, were they were they forcing these, or were they being preserved in their um, underground um, pits in their homes? Um, and we're not sure how uh, if these were pickled cucumbers or fresh cucumbers, but it, it's just an interesting um, thought that um, um, to know that they were actually providing cucumbers for the household in, in the uh, winter time, in the winter months. Another uh, relation to cucumber was the, um, the gherkin, uh, which bears small cucumber-like fruits, and they're very spiny. And this was also a crop that uh, Jefferson recommended to his brother Randolph in 1813. He said, the season being over for planting everything but the gherkin, it is that by which we distinguish the very small pickling cucumber. And it's likely the West Indian gherkin, which is a native of Africa, and it was brought um, to the Caribbean through the slave trade. Um, we know that, that uh, then it was probably introduced from Jamaica into the Richmond area and seed was first sold by a Richmond merchant. So, um, oh, sorry, there we go. Um, cabbages were probably the second most uh, commonly purchased uh, vegetable from the enslaved. Um, 23 purchases are uh, recorded. Um, and, and again, uh, a lot of the cabbages were purchased in, in December and, and in the winter months. Uh, I suspect that perhaps they were even making sauerkraut or, or preserving the, the cabbages. Cabbages can be kept over the winter fairly easily um, by, by uh, actually burying the heads uh, underground. So it's not quite as an unusual to see a fresh cabbage in December as, a, as you would uh, uh, a cucumber. <laughs> um, the uh, Simlins, uh, which were a common name in Jefferson's day for um, what we call today patty pan squash, um, is really a, a white scallop summer squash um, that was grown in, in Jefferson's retirement garden and purchased commonly uh, from uh, the gardens of the enslaved. And it was used, uh, added in family soup recipes and likely uh, boiled and, and stewed along with butter and a little salt and pepper, which sounds wonderful to me. <laughs> Potatoes, again, another South American um, uh, crop that uh, were quite well uh, commonly cultivated by Jefferson's day. And, and we do have a, a number of um, uh, purchases of uh, potatoes from the enslaved. Uh, at one point um, in January, a half a bushel of potatoes were, were purchased from Gil Gillette, uh, one of the enslaved, uh, and also from Betty Hemmings, who was um, providing half a bushel of uh, potatoes for the household. And the potatoes and, and the uh, okra were, were important in, ingredients in um, a, uh, a dish that I'll explain in a moment. Um, but we know that the ens enslaved African Americans introduced okra to the colonies by way of the West Indies. Um, we believe that this crop originated in Ethiopia. In Jefferson's only published book, Notes on the State of Virginia, he records that the, that the gardens of his, uh, of his native state yield, yield um, musk melons, watermelons, tomatoes, okra, pomegranate, figs, and the esculent plants of Europe. But it wasn't until 1809 that um, okra was planted actually in the Monticello garden. And um, we know that it, uh, the young fruit pods were often combined with tomatoes for soups and, and gumbos in, in, the, in Jefferson family recipes. In 1813, Jefferson edged an entire square of vegetables um, of the vegetable garden with um, with okra and tomatoes. The, uh, this book, The Virginia Housewife uh, by Mary Randolph was first published in 1824. And um, we know that Mary Randolph was, uh, was a relative by marriage uh, to Thomas Jefferson and she ran a boarding house in Richmond. And many uh, Jefferson family members use recipes from this book and we, uh, we are aware of some of them. And, um, and are demonstrated at Monticello. Um, it was a very popular book actually. It went through many editions uh, during the 19th century and, the, and, and uh, but her, her book was published, she died in 1828. So the, the first publication is the book that we are most um, interested in. And one of the, um, unfortunately um, we don't believe uh, many recipes from her book can be attributed to the to the enslaved chefs, although we, they probably knew about them. It's just, we don't have records that document their use. We do know some recipes that are attributed to uh, James Hemings' brother, Peter, 
um, who made muffins, and also other re recipes that can be attributed to uh, Edith Fawcett and Francis Hearn. But one of the interesting ones that we know was used in the household was a, a dish called gumbo. And um, it it's really a West Indian dish. As you can see, it, it included not only um, okra, but also um, uh, peppers and other um, uh, and tomatoes, of course, uh, was a very important uh, dish in combination with it. And there's another uh, recipe. And so, um, of course, I'd like to show the lovely tomatoes in the garden. I know Ira is a tomato expert, so I don't want to enter. <laughs> but uh, here they are all combined together. And um, interestingly, um, this gumbo dish um, not, not only included the tomatoes and okra and peppers, but it also included um, Simlin, Simlin, so the patty pan squash, Irish, Irish potatoes, and um, onions, parsley, bacon, and sometimes chicken broth was added later. And Peter Hatch likes to say that this was a compelling metaphor for the Monticello garden. It was a rich blend of American native vegetables grown by American Indians, like lima beans and Simlins, South and Central American discoveries adapted by both Northern uh, potatoes and Southern uh, and tomato Europeans, and tied together by an African plant, the okra, grown by both the French and enslaved Blacks in the West Indies, rarely known among white Virginians and prepared by African-American chefs at Monticello. Sesame was another important um, uh, African crop uh, uh, cultivated at Monticello. Um, uh, Jefferson uh, wrote that, I do not believe there exists so perfect a substitute for olive oil as the sesame. And sesame is believed to be the oldest oil seed crop known to mankind. Um, it prospers in, in drought conditions and originated in sub-Saharan Africa where wild types still grow. And we grow sesame in, in beds in the garden, but of course Jefferson was, uh, they were cultivated at Monticello in the fields. They were field crops. Um, both the whole seeds and the, and the oil are eaten. Um, Jefferson called the sesame by four different names, Benny, as you can see the different spellings there, I think they're all pronounced the same, but um, this was uh, uh, it's just an interesting derivation of the, the, the uh, French name for sesame. And Benny wafers are, are sesame cookies that are still made today. And um, toasted sesame is, was also pressed as oil. Sesame was a very important um, uh, oil that Jefferson wanted to introduce um, when he was president. And um, um, let me just go back back to that for a second. Um, um, and in fact, there was a, a blind taste test when he was president um, and it turned out that se the sesame oil was the favorite, but it was never, he was never very successful in, in um, pr producing oil from the sesame. Um, they, they were able to produce it, but it, it just took an enormous amount of seed to produce a small amount of oil. <laughs> Um, other crops, of course, included um, eggplant. Uh, eggplant is from Southeast Asia, but it, it is believed that um, it was introduced uh, again um, through the, the slave trade. Um, and Jefferson um, documents both the white and purple varieties that were cultivated in the, in the, in the garden uh, side by side at Monticello uh, as, as late as 1812. P uh, Peanuts, Jefferson called them peendars, <laughs> were also cultivated in the garden. And although they're native of South America, peanuts were introduced in, into Africa by Europeans and quickly became a common staple crop. The natural uh, historian, Sir, Sir Hans Sloan, uh, reported how slaves were fed on peanuts on slave ships from Africa. And then uh, the, the peanuts were grown in, slave, in the enslaved gardens, uh, the gardens of the enslaved in Jamaica. Um, he wrote that the ships um, were, were filled with peanuts uh, when they were uh, uh, brought to these, these islands. Peanuts were probably introduced to the British col colonies uh, in that way. And in South Carolina, there, there are plenty of these nuts. It is believed that they were uh, cultivated by the enslaved uh, because if they grow underground, they could be kept in their gardens in secret uh, where their masters would not see them growing uh, a food crop. Um, sweet potatoes were also um, a species that were cultivated um, and Jefferson noted that the enslaved uh, tended to them generally, that they were very popular in their own gardens. So um, Monticello really includes 
crops from all parts of the world. Uh, again, Peter Hatch liked to say it was an Ellis Island of vegetables in the gardens at Monticello, but we um, never want to forget the uh, contributions and the um, uh, effort that it, it took to, to produce these many vegetables and uh, primarily, which was done primarily by the enslaved at Monticello who were cultivating the garden and also raising um, the, the animals and producing uh, the chickens and eggs as well that were purchased by the, the family. So um, I'll, I'll end with that um, slide. <laughs> Well, that was tremendous, Peggy. Thank you for sharing. Um, this is great because now we can see from Ira sort of some of the steps in between then and now and some of the work that's going on to, to preserve some of those varieties um, that we continue to, to use in our gardens. Oh, yes, and I will be sharing, Ira. <laughs> Just one moment. <laughs> Let's begin. <laughs> um, so this is just fantastic. Um, And start right. from the beginning. Great. Uh, well, you know, I have loved collards since I was a girl, uh, but I didn't really think about collard as, as a species where there were lots of different varieties until I met Ed Davis, uh, who is one of the co-authors of this book, Collard, A Southern Tradition from Seed to Table. And uh, there are a couple of the most different collards, a, a variegated uh, one from Florida that you'll never see that variegation unless you save it to seed because it only does that in the winter just before it's about uh, to send up a seed stock. And uh, the blue collard, uh, this one is Alabama blue, but there's a whole range of them that come uh, mostly from Alabama and Mississippi and Louisiana. Next slide. Could you, uh, here is uh, part of a trial of the Davis Morgan accessions. They, uh, I, I kind of say Davis and Morgan, it's a story of a road trip of uh, botanical uh, exploration and of a forgotten history of one of the varieties that have been uh, developed here in the Southeast US. Uh, in the time that were, Peggy was talking about uh, in colonial America, there were no collards yet to speak of. They call them, Jefferson called them coal warts, which was uh, a not very respected or well-liked by Europeans, uh, leafy brassica. And, uh, but, a little further south in Charleston and across uh, the southern tier of uh, the southeast, I guess, honestly, part of that was Virginia still at that time and the Carolinas. Um, enslaved people were selecting uh, from what those cohorts, ones that they liked, and these. Uh, darker leaved ones with purple stems and stuff were more like uh, the leafy greens that were seen in Africa. And some, and some college were there, but uh, most of the history says they could not have uh, developed in Africa because they require cool temperatures to produce seeds. And most of the places where they came from in Africa, there was not enough cool time to make seeds of them. So uh, people conjecture that the Portuguese took uh, cohorts to Africa and uh, in their settlements had seeds which spread and there's a lot of, uh, you know, kind of like what we call collards and what came to be known as collards, uh, were developed in the Southeast. There also is a, a certain amount of development in uh, Africa and also in Brazil, which furthers the Portuguese link of carrying the seeds uh, to Africa. But it is without a doubt that the popularization 
the uh, figuring out how to cook them in a way that was appealing. <laughs> uh, and uh, the selection away from bitterness that early colors had happened in the Southeast. And possibly a lot of it was in that area in the Carolinas uh, where uh, the rice culture, uh, which again came from Africa, was developed. And that sesame seed that uh, Peggy mentioned was also cultivated at that same time. Uh, this uh, picture is from one of the trials of 60, we, at that time there were out 60 of the 90 accessions of heirloom collards that were being saved by older seed stewards in the Southeast. Let's see another one. This is uh, MacArthur Walter. He was one of the gentlemen who shared his collard uh, with Ed Davis. And uh, that is one of the purple collards. And what's nice about that slide is it shows you that these are land races. They're not uniform like the seeds that you buy uh, you know, from the store, there's ones that have uh, white ribs and ones that are more purple and have red ribs. It's pretty good. Next one. The Collard Shack, I had to mention because uh, it's one of the places that kind of preserve to be uh, the yellow cabbage collard, which is very popular in uh, North Carolina. Let's see, maybe at next slide, I think has some cabbage collards. Uh, yeah, there it is. And, and again, the cabbage collards are also a bit of a land race because both the one, the uh, right hen pecked, which has sides that are a little like chickens had pick, pecked on them and the more uh, heading uh, yellow cabbage collards uh, are intertwined. And since they have been all that long, we keep them that way rather than selecting for the one or the other. Let's see the next one. And here's another row from that uh, trial of the David Morgan, Davis Morgan sessions. I, I, I tell you, this was at the, this particular trial was at the USDA Iraq in Charleston. And it's what got me uh, convinced that I had to, uh, get our friends in seed saving to reintroduce all of this genetic diversity to gardeners uh, all over the country. That's uh, Nancy Malone wheat is one that we're starting to offer in our catalog this year. And there, uh, there are a number of ones being offered by Seed Savers Exchange as well from the Davis Morgan collection. And if you wanna become a seed saver, you can join Seed Savers Exchange and start uh, getting access to some of the varieties that we don't have enough seed yet to offer commercially uh, on your own seed saving adventure. Let's see the next one. Uh, this is Michael Twitty. He's a, a, a chef and garden writer and cultural historian uh, and uh, I happen to have a picture of him with a bunch of the collards from uh, the collard trial that we did here at Southern Exposure uh, a year ago. And uh, you can see him talking about this, uh, about collards on YouTube uh, during the collard week that we had this January. Uh, let's look at the next one. Uh, this is Cecil Stroud. He's another one of the collards stewards and he's kind of fun because he represents how these uh, varieties were collected. Davis and Morgan and sometimes Mark Firenham went on road trips to areas that had big concentration, concentrations of extension agents who said there were gardeners who were still saving seeds from collard and they'd see the big collards from the road drive up knock on the door, knock, knock, can I, I saw your lovely collards and I wonder if you wanted to talk about them. And you know, those gardeners wanted to talk. And most of them were extremely generous and safe in sharing seeds of uh, their collards with Davis and Morgan uh, 
that were later uh, stored in the USDA gene bank, which was nice for us because 20 years later, we were able to get some from that good storage situation to start this collard project. Let's look at the next one. Uh, there are things that are more than uh, just how the greens look uh, that's hiding in the genetic diversity. This is usually colors have yellow flowers and this white flowered one uh, flowered uh, almost a month before the others. And we believe it was selected on the Georgia, Florida vote order and we believe it was selected because of the early flowering and the low need for chill so that as you get into those warmer areas, you would more uh, routinely get seeds from the plants. Let's move on. One. So having heard a little bit about this and knowing there are so many varieties I didn't have time to show you, you can get involved. Uh, we are looking, uh, we have a website, heirloomcollards.org, uh, where you can see all the collards. We have 60 plus uh, different varieties there that you can uh, look at. Uh, you can also uh, get uh, involved in trying to preserve some of these varieties. If you're really ready, you can uh, email collards at seedsavers.org and find out about the project to get stewards for some of these uh, heirloom varieties. Uh, and you can uh, join our Instagram and Facebook groups. Uh, yeah, we want you to be involved. I think that's it. Okay, I will stop the screen share here. That was fantastic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, really, I what I really think is amazing, just the Brassica family, it blows me away to think that, okay, we've got turnips, we've got broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, all of these things, and we're eating different parts of the plant. But then with one little family in that collards, there's all of that diversity. And and you I love that picture of the um of the white flowering one because you know we're usually thinking, okay well, what do, what do the greens look like? And that's the diversity that we see, but there's maturity, there's cold hardiness, there's all of those other variables. So it's just kind of mind blowing to me um, when you put it all out there and you know we can share and look at that. Uh, so we'll go to some Q and A. We had a visitor or, or uh, viewer ask us what our favorite historic variety is. Um, so we'll kind of let that be our, our opening question. Um, it's a variety of, of collards or just in general? I think in general. I think in general. I can go first since you all okay. have, you know, been carrying the weight. Uh, the one thing I've been most excited about lately uh, has been fava bean. Um, and we've got some growing here at Gunston Hall. And, you know, being from the Midwest, we don't do a lot of things that overwinter because it can get quite cold, um, really just extreme temperatures that will kill a lot of things in the field. Um, but so to have you know, I've got maybe eight or nine rows of fava beans that more or less overwintered is really exciting me. Um, and I'm watching them just kind of shoot up now. And um, that would be my pick for his historic variety. And it was a versatile thing too, um, used for just cooking and, and um, but also at times for um, horses, et cetera. So just a very fascinating crop. It's, and it's an old world bean um, as opposed to um, American beans. And it, uh, Jefferson called it Windsor bean. That was yeah, one of the that's names. right. Broad bean was another common name, and it's not happy in the heat. So you're right that you want to grow it over the, the winter time or very early spring. And um, and it sometimes can be problematic for us. Sometimes it gets a, a little bit of a blight, and so you have to. I think it's from uh, too much heat or from the heavy soil. So, um, um, but if you're, if you're successful, it's a it's a great it's a great crop. Yeah. I love the I love the plants. The flowers are very unusual too. They, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know what's what's funny about planting them is we grew them especially because my English friend Pam Dolling really likes them, and we've yeah. planted them anywhere from the middle of February till the middle of March, and they come mm -hmm. up within two days of each other, 
any time right. planted in that period. Isn't that peculiar? It really is. I know, it, it's funny because I watched them most of October slowly and they were this big for months, um, but now they're just sort of taking off and, and it's, it's gonna be a joy to watch them. <laughs> Well, it's hard for me to pick a vegetable because it's like I'm a seasonal person. Like in the in the spring, I love all the all the colworts and the and the and the um, you know the brassicas, the the kales and the broccolis and and so forth. And then in, in the summer, I'm a tomato fan. I'm really not, I don't like tomatoes when they're not in the summer in the in the and they're vine ripened. Uh, to me, they have that's how to eat them. Um, I do love okra, especially when it's young, uh, little pods, but um, uh, peas, of course, they always say Jefferson's favorite vegetable was a pea with the English pea, and I, uh, I do like those, but uh, I, I, I like looking at peas more than than eating peas. I think. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, they're hard to pick. Well, they're pretty. They're pretty plant. Yeah. I just think they're. I just you know, I like the, the the ornamental pea, sweet pea, as well as the the garden pea, and uh, I just love the lushness and the twining. You know that they. Uh, you know, same with scarlet runner beans. They're just beautiful to look at. I think, but. but but the collards, Ira, you just got me thinking about my mother again, who grew collards over the winter down in Southern Pines, North Carolina. That's where I'm from. And, uh, you know, we, I think uh, her, I mean, I was eating, uh, Monica, we had the green glaze collards in the garden of the summer and I, and I was uh, or the, in the fall and I was picking and I think I was the only one eating it, but it was, it was really good. But it, it's never as good as my way my mother cooked collards. And I think it's because I don't eat um, meat now, and she used to put a little bit of bacon or fat back in with her collards, and I think that's what gave her her collards the, the very distinctive flavor. Yeah, uh, you know, I I think if you take onions and garlic and uh, caramelize them a little bit, and then in olive oil, and then add that to your collards, it makes a, a fair representative rich collard for vegetarians. That sounds, that sounds like a good, you know, I don't think about doing that. I just kind of put them in a pot with water and pour some olive oil on it. And, but I think caramelizing the, the seasoning with the, the onions and garlic and, and olive oil in the beginning would be the way to go. Sounds yeah, like you're, and you know, you're cooking me. <laughs> yeah, well, the Brazil, in Brazil, they have a machine in the markets that mm -hmm. uh, chiffonades them so that you take them home, cut up with all that surface area and, mm -hmm. uh, and then they'll cook in like 10 or 15 minutes too. Yeah, and she would boil them a lot longer than you would a normal, normally with kale or something like that, you know, yeah. Well, I told you, I like collards, I like, purple collards, I, but I really have to say I'm kind of prejudiced. Collards are best in the winter, yeah. uh, you know, uh, but I was in Jamaica uh, a few years ago in July and they served me a collard salad and they grow uh, succession plantings of them and only let them get to be, you know, like six inches to a foot high and then they cut them off and make these summer salads. Mm. Uh, and yeah. so, you yeah. know, and brassicas make a lot of seeds. It's not really like it's exorbitant to, uh, you know, plant a bunch of uh, successions. And mm. so that's something that was kind of new to me. It was, uh, it, it was a little bit like massage kale that we have here, the way the salad was, it was pretty tasty. Well, yep. st sticking on the topic of uh, collards, I had a question come to us that says, what heirloom collard would you recommend for a beginner gardener in Farquhar County, Virginia to grow? Well, shoot, you live in Virginia, you can grow whatever you want to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you really want to know the truth, uh, uh, Georgia Green, which is a very common everyday collard is also an old one from you know, the 1800s, uh, it was available. And it grows fast and easy, and it'll make you think you're a really good gardener. And then you can uh, you know, go to ones that are a little slower growing at first. 
And I suggest growing them as a fall vegetable so that you uh, plant them in late summer and you know, the end of August, beginning of September, so that they're coming into their own when it's in cool weather. Yeah, I've always found that timing aspect to be really challenging. Maybe you could speak to, you know, because you're starting these little seedlings when it's really, really hot out. Um, do you have any tips for, for solving that? Like, are you keeping them in the shade? I, I plant them in an area that has natural shade in the afternoon. I generally either cover them with a lightweight row cover, spun polyester to keep all the bugs off of them. Mm -hmm. But uh, before poly, before that came along, because I've been gardening before there was row cover of that type, uh, I would cover it with a uh, window screen uh, to both kind of keep it cooler and keep things from biting it when it was so tiny that it couldn't stand even one bite. Yeah, that's one of the most discouraging moments uh, to find a cabbage moth has just laid their eggs and, and uh, like you said, it's only one bite. Yeah, and and you, yeah, yeah. If they would uh, just wait, we used to use coal frames that had uh, a screen yeah. on uh, top, and uh, we also used to use a fine mesh tool to keep the bugs out of them uh, mm -hmm. before we had remay type stuff. You have trouble with harlequin beetles. Um, they they attack some of our, especially in the summer, the um, sea kale plants and the horseradish. It's just they're uh, they uh, attack a lot of stuff. <laughs> yes, yes. Just cut the foliage off and let it regrow again because they're so they can be very uh, pernicious and uh, they just multiply like uh, amazing. Uh, I did happily note though they they were not as bad here as they were when I was growing in Kansas. Really, I think um, you brought them to the east thing because we didn't. Oh, really? Okay, uh, not fair, but <laughs> um, yeah, I just I just thought that the plants here were a little bit hardier. Um, it's pretty common in July to have, you know, well over a hundred, but then like an intense wind and it just dries out. I guess we get that here sometimes, but but I found the plants to be a little bit hardier here, and mm -hmm. I haven't seen an infestation as bad as my garden back back there. Okay. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Well, any final thoughts? Uh, we're kind of getting to the wrap up point. Um, well, I think you should definitely uh, keep up with Ira's um, collard project because um, it's been ongoing, I think, for a couple of years, isn't it? Hasn't yeah. Ira? And, yeah. yeah. And, you know, we have our, she's, Ira and I have been involved with the Monticello's Heritage Harvest Festival every fall. Last year, we uh, we're kind of went virtual with things and this still be ongoing this year. We hope we can have an in-person event in 2022, but, but yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're doing pretty well with these um, virtual events. And so it's always good to, to stay in touch with both our websites to, um, to see our latest um, endeavors and, and gardening and, um, and uh, there are a lot of free opportunities, obviously. So that's that's always fun as well. So, um, uh, but we Ira has been a great friend um, with Monticello uh, for probably what fifteen years now, at yeah. least. Yeah. Yeah. You so. know, it has been my pleasure to see uh, Monticello over those fifteen years include the whole plantation. Uh, yeah. and uh, really share more the role of the enslaved people in making Monticello a national treasure. Uh, and so uh, important. Yeah. That, that, that it, it seemed like a good time for me to have run into uh, our neighbors. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll plug too, um, just if you're listening to this, uh, certainly just go and garden. Um, it's a great time of year to do it. Um, and we know a lot of folks have want to build on the experiences of last year. And um, Ira, you, you all's website, uh, Southern Seed, oh my gosh, my words, Southern, Southern Exposure Seed. Well, you all have fantastic resources for anyone living in Virginia. 
I have been referencing your, your like planting dates and a lot of the timing aspects for your different crops and they are spot on. Um, so I recommend anyone growing in this region to definitely take, a t take the time and look at some of those things. Um, actually, the link will be in the comments, um, Lacey says here, so that's been posted. Um, so just tremendous resources and, and there's a lot of really fantastic varieties to try out. So, so definitely get out and, and plant those in your, in your gardens at home. Um, so with that, we'll kind of wrap up. Yeah. This was I talked about as well. Um, you know, we, we uh, are growing for uh, seed production and for sale through our, our website. Um, you know, uh, the sesame, okra, um, many tomatoes, just like Ira and um, other crops are, are all not only available, but they're, they're collected from the gardens at Monticello and, and cleaned and packaged by the gardener. So um, it's always good to keep, keep, a, keep an eye on, on our, our seed sale offerings. Um, and some of the, some we, we uh, actually purchase wholesale from Southern Exposure Seed Exchange and, and make it available through our packets. So we're, we're all one big happy family, I think, as far as preserving these historic varieties, yeah. Definitely. And one of the things too, I think you all have a celosia, um, a specific type that I haven't, I haven't found anywhere else. It's really cool kind that of makes just this giant flame of a, of a flower. Um, and, and I just associate it with Monticello and I, I believe it dates to the 18th century. So we're going to be trying to grow some of it here as well. Um, so yeah, just fantastic. Um, so if this is a type of program you like, certainly support all of these, uh, institutions, um, Monticello and Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. See, I got it. Um, and uh, do what you can to help out and, and have a great time in your garden. Um, I'm going to turn it over, though, to Lacey, our education manager, and she's just going to share a little bit about um, a few of the things that we have coming up over the next couple of weeks. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today, everyone. I am so excited about all of the programs that we have coming up here at Gunston Hall. For one thing, we are starting a very small plant sale here at Gunston Hall for those who are in the Northern Virginia region. Um, we are also looking forward to our Kite Festival event. More details about what that's going to look like coming out this week. And we're gearing up for our Summer Saturdays program starting in June, uh, July, and August. So we're excited to have you join us. We do have links in the chat in the comments for all of our websites, all of our, our materials. So you can visit the Monticello shop, you can visit Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, and you can visit us at Gunston Hall. We'd also love to know what you thought about this program. If you have thoughts or feedback, uh, there's a link in the comments so that you can uh, give us your feedback on what you thought about this program. Well, thanks everyone. Thank you very much and we'll see you again soon, I hope. <laughs> yeah, thanks for inviting me, it was fun. Yeah, terrific, thank you, Ira. Bye-bye. <laughs>